Uh, cool. Yeah, thanks guys for coming. Um, many of you may already have a strong inkling as to why you're interested in developing communities. The, you know, the subject of this talk is why it, is it beneficial to start one or join one. Um, but you might already know, right? Like perhaps you're looking for collaborators, perspective from outside your own development team. Uh, you may desire to find like-minded peers in your city or any reason whatsoever to like, get out of bed in the morning uh, instead of working from your laptop with pillows. Um, and alternately, and I think this bears pointing out, you may already work at like a large studio uh, and you already have peers around you all the time, uh, but a creative community outside your workspace can provide perspective and I personally think we could do with more and more developers at larger studios feeling welcome into our indie communities, uh, whatever that word means to you at this point. Notably, each group represented here is unique in how it operates and the reason it exists. Uh, I asked each speaker today to impart some wisdom to you about what their particular group is, why it exists, and how it exists. Um, it's a great honor for me to be hosting the speakers today. Uh, like Akira said, I cover a group here in LA called Rich City, uh, and as we're sort of going blindly through the process of developing a workspace and fostering the community, we look to groups like these today to you know, look for ideas and points of contrast and encouragement. Um, moreover, I'm honored to be involved in the subject and have any part in encouraging more communities to flourish uh, because without community, I wouldn't have met uh, Alex Preston, who uh, invited me into the Hyperlit Drifter team. Uh, without community, I wouldn't be working at, or I would be working at home in a manner that I've learned to be damaging to my well-being. Uh, and without community, my work would be more insular, less inspired, and considerably less encouraged. Since we're short on time, I'm going to cut out everything that isn't a noun. Um, uh, so Syed Salahuddin, uh, artist, game designer, New York City, Baby Castles, uh, Video Game Collective, Queens, New York, uh, Games, Culture, 2006, Syed, Expert, Games, Technology, Work, Public Broadcasting Service, National Public Radio, New York Times, this is really misleading now. Uh, adjunct Professor, Teaching, oh, Adjunct Professor, Computer Programming, NYU. Um, so hi, I'm Syed, um, I co-founded uh, a space called Baby Castles, um, and uh, apart from all that stuff, I also work at Little Bits now, and um, uh, I, work, I live with 20 people in a cooperative housing situation in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Um, so, uh, today I'm going to talk about um, a very specific type of ethic that's related to communities. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's something that coalesced around the 80s uh, with venues like ABC No Rio in, um, in downtown uh, or lower Manhattan. Um, it's, the term is called DIY. Um, DIY is a pretty uh, broad term in the scope of music venues and art spaces. It has a very specific parameter. Um, and it's not the, it's, this isn't the DIY that you come across when uh, you're at Home Depot. This is a very specific DIY that's informed by a certain set of ethics. Um, and uh, a DIY venue is usually a non-commercial, all-ages, all-inclusive space that adheres to um, uh, these agreements between the communities uh, and its, its people. Um, and it's usually based around some form of anti-oppression or anti-consumerism activism. Um, in NYC, those, those ethics were a response to neo-Nazi and anti-feminist hardcore punk bands um, in like the early 80s that had plagued venues like CBGBs with violence, racism, sexism, and ageism. And um, uh, some people were like, well, we're, we're fed up with this this crap. We want our people, we want our places to be safe, um, and we want people to come in and have a good time, so we're going to create um, new spaces that um, cultivated that, cultivated this new way of thinking and, and this way of, of being safe. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some of the spaces that existed in the past few years and exist now. Um, this image is uh, a show at the original Solid Barn, a DIY venue that existed in Queens. Um, that's where Baby Castles got its start. 
Um, the person in the picture is crowd surfing while simultaneously playing a game of Quop on our crowd surfing stock cyborg animal arcade unit named Quop Bear. Um, and stuff like this was kind of like what you would see at any given night at a DIY music venue, right? Um, and that's like one of our first arcade cabinets. Um, actually, Adam was one of the first. Uh, he had one of the first games to be shown at Baby Castles in 2009. Um, we operated outside of uh, the basement of this punk venue, uh, and because it was a DIY venue, we kind of inherited all of its values. So uh, Silent Barn um, was all ages. Um, it, uh, you couldn't have any kind of like uh, sponsorships. Um, you uh, couldn't restrict access to people, uh, so because of their age or race or anything like that. Um, so these ethics were kind of like imbued into baby castles, this kind of like fledgling like event that happened. It wasn't really community at the time, and um, and kind of set us on a course to where we are today, which I don't get to. Um, and. I'll show you some photos of other venues. Um, so this is Market Hotel, also in NYC, that was curated by a group of people who lived at the space. It was a relatively large space. Um, lots of really amazing um, uh, bands played there. Um, a lot of these uh, images are very sweaty. Um, <laughs> and so DIY, what do DIY spaces offer? They offer musicians an alternative to 21 plus ticket master clear channel like venues. Not only is this more accessible because you know you can get uh, people, the college age people, to come and, and see your shows. They also give a major, uh, majority of the door money to the show uh, of the show to the performers. So if you're playing, if you're uh, a band and you're playing, you're an artist, you sh uh, you're showing your work. The money that uh, is generated generally goes goes to you. And what that does is that it helps to make this scene. Happen. It, it helps people uh, do what they want to do uh, without having to uh, without having to think about you know the commercialness of the stuff they're creating. They could just kind of like be free, you know, in some ways. Um, it cuts out the middleman, um, and uh, Baby Castles also kind of followed a similar model with its games when we were at uh, Song Barn and then later created a, another DIY venue called uh, 285 Kent, um, we would give a cut of the door to the game developers when we had a show. So we'd have like, uh, like a big music show where we would have Cool Keith or Wu-Tang or this is Aesop Rocky or Grimes. We would uh, we'd give them money and then the games that were being shown uh, would also get a portion of the door as well. Um, so uh, a few more. A few more images of 285 Kent and what that looked like. It was like one of the largest DIY spaces in New York City at the time. It shut down last year or year before that. Um, there's music, there's there's games, installations, performance arts, and um, it's just this wonderful, beautiful place to like just escape New York City and do stuff. Um, and what's cool is that this isn't this isn't targeted to any type of community. It's not targeted to the games community, it's not targeted to the, the, the DIY music community, it's for everybody. And it's like it's it's like a it's a place that has um, uh, has it's it has a place that has like a general and universal mission that it that it's uh, trying to bring people together. Um, and this is our, our latest exhibition. Um, uh, or was our latest, is not our latest, it's our last exhibition, sorry. Our last exhibition is Salma Lake and Baby Castles. Um, uh, we just opened up a space in, on 14th Street um, in Manhattan. Um, we spent about a year kind of like <coughs> trying to figure out what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And, and um, most of the time was agonizing over a mission statement. So if you are looking for, to start, a community, make sure you want, you know what you want to do. Like, what are your beliefs? What are what are what are the systems of beliefs that you you want to adhere to? Um, what are the things that you? What are the goals for the community? And how you know how do you want to grow? And how do you how do you want to be inclusive? You know, how do you want to change the world? You know, that's like those those are the processes, right? And that's we spent about a year doing that. And um, 
And this, these are some of the images of like our exhibition. It was, it was, uh, it was like maybe Castles was uh, an exhibition of, of games by non-Western developers and, and um, mainly from Muslim backgrounds. And so that was one of the key things that when we started our, our, our gallery and we formed our mission statement is that we wanted to be inclusive and like kind of like push marginalized groups forward into the mainstream because now we have a platform, right? Like we, we started out, we got really successful and, and we have a, a decent amount of people who follow us and, and, and look at our stuff. And so we want to make sure we show things that matter to us and show things that most people don't actually show. Um, and that's our, that's, our, that's our thing, right? Um, this is also another show that we did at the New Space. This is Rat King, um, a hip hop group, a rap group from, um, from the Bronx, um, um, they did their record release um, at our space, um, and then most recently we had about two weeks ago we had Julian Assange, who's a, a book launch and an MIA stop by, just like just drop by. <laughs> it's like totally bizarre. This didn't feel real at all. Um, this is me taking a selfie with Julian Assange while we uh, while we projected him across the street. Um, um, Another image of that event. Um, this is our, our latest exhibition. It's a universe is a small hat. It's a musical theater, uh, multiplayer musical theater piece. That's uh, this is kind of inspired by Sleep No More, but it's a way more interactive. Um, it just looks really cool. So I, I just uh, the, the, the entire thing. You're kind of like in this futuristic utopian society that is set place in in a. Uh, in a spaceship, and it looks super, super rad. And um, this is this this is our kind of like our latest our latest baby. And then the big announcement I had an announcement. I wanted to say something new in this uh, uh, at this talk was that we're starting an academy. It's called Baby Castles Academy. We're going to be focusing on education now. That's one of the things that we want to do. So we're going to be offering uh, classes that. Um, that show you how to uh, make installation-based games work. So like, like how do you do baby castles? It's literally called how to baby castles. Um, and uh, we have classes that have to do uh, that have to do with like neuroscience and, and brain hacking and uh, how do you read brain states to make uh, to change games or interactive part of it. We have uh, uh, classes that it's not totally confirmed yet, but uh, this person named Jeff Larson, who had the uh, byline in the Guardian and New York Times articles uh, when the Snowden leak happened, he did the security for the Snowden leak. So he's going to be doing a class about the you know security and transparency and stuff like that. Just like really rad people talking about really rad things that are not just like Ruby on Rails. Media. You know. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So that's like, and these are like kind of the examples of like two of the workshops we've done before, like how to how to just kind of like DIY in an arcade, and it's gonna be all ages. So every everyone from like a, a, like eight and up, or even you know, if, I don't know, even smaller maybe, um, can can join and take a class. And that's it. So that's baby castles. That's that's me on the other side. That's our site. We don't really have links. We, I don't. I don't know why. But we, so if you go to slash donate, uh, if you like, if you want to donate and become a member, you can do that. Or you go to slash academy, you can look at the. You can preview the classes right now. And that's it. Sorry. Cannibal, capsule, the Hunger Games girl on fire, the Kenbe Matumbo's four and a half weeks to save the world, Overland, uh, Adam. This isn't fun anymore. Uh, Adam, not not this. This is super fun. I mean, the nan thing. Um, uh, Adam is in Texas. He's also an advisor to GDC, Fantastic Arcade, uh, Huegos, as I mentioned, and the NYU Game Center Incubator. Uh, Adam lives in Texas with his wife, sons, and pug dogs. Thank you, Adam. Um, so, in what I think is like really apt Huegos Rancheros fashion, like. This slideshow came together about 20 minutes ago. Uh, top, about 20 minutes before the fire alarm, anyway. Um, uh, which is kind of how we tend to roll uh, every month. But, um, uh, right, oh, that's me. Oh, wait, so this is Wagos Rancheros. These are all the organizers. Um, that's me. Uh, this is Joe Lammert, um, who does some stuff with White Whale, who made a game called God of Blades, and they were doing, they just did a Kickstarter for this crazy Pictionary game called Monstro Cards. That's her dog, Kirby. Um, 
This is Brandon Boyer, uh, who does Venus Patrol and IGF Chairman and a whole bunch of other magical things. Uh, Rachel Wheel, uh, who runs the Femicon Game Museum, which is sort of like a, it's definitely go, like, go check it out right away. Um, she's a uh, NES and uh, Apple II assembly programmer and uh, does uh, has a master's in like video games for girls somehow. I don't, it's she's amazing. <coughs> Um, and uh, Wiley Wiggins, who runs Caracasa, they're doing a game called Thunderbeam, uh, and also has been in a bunch of movies and uh, does kisses. Uh, and so our start is, um, I think it was weird for us, so we don't, I don't know, I still don't know if we have a mission statement, but uh, back in 2009, 2010, we were doing a lot of that. Um, the Alamo Draft House, which is this interesting um, kind of cultural space in Austin, uh, offered us uh, kind of a happy hour thing on Sundays when they weren't doing anything anyway and nobody was going to their bar anyway. Uh, and so on May 1st, 2011, we uh, kind of did a show thing there where we had a game on a stage and there were drinks and a bunch of people were sort of hanging out and it was cool. Um, and then we've done 36 of these so far, uh, which is cool. Um, and we've been kind of figuring out which what it is that we're doing that works and what doesn't, what it is that we want to do in the future. Um, usually there's a little short presentation at the start where we talk about some games or talk about our guests or um, talk about games that came out recently but maybe we don't have at the thing. Um, uh, like Brandon's doing there. Uh, and then uh, mostly there's just like uh, drinking drinks and playing games. Usually we've got a big multiplayer game on a big theater screen on one side of the room and then uh, we have some uh, smaller games that we've selected from around the world uh, that usually are kind of not out yet or something or are hard to get a hold of or hard to play uh, without a group of people, without some kind of physical setup. Uh, and then there's a space on the other side of the room where kind of anybody from uh, the Austin, Texas area can bring in a uh, game that they're working on for people to just play. Um, we had um, interstellar selfie station booth thing set up there for a while, and we had a cotton candy machine, and it was really good. This is Pendleton Ward playing Tenuanya Teens. Um, so uh, here's some things that were not, and this is, in Austin, this is a big deal. Like, I feel like in this group of people, this isn't going to sound weird or strange at all. But, uh, <coughs> In uh, the Austin situation was very much about um, people swapping business cards and having a sponsor come in and present their uh, cloud server thing and then <laughs> some other things uh, and that was that was the only communities that we had in, in Austin back in 2010 2009 uh, and so our mission statement at first was very much not about this is what we're going to do but this is what we're going to not do there's not going to be a business cards thing. There's not going to be a, this person is hiring. There's not, we're just not going to do that. Um, and part of that is because it's not just a meetup for game developers. We wanted to be a meetup where people who just like movies and like uh, comic books and like um, independent music and, oh, oh look, there's also weird independent beautiful games. Um, that's cool. And it's kind of become kind of an ambassadorial cultural thing, I guess. Um, so we do, we started doing game jams once or twice a year. Uh, this one was to uh, create games in these like crazy neon teepees in Martha, Texas, uh, which is like the weirdest place in the world. Um, and that was awesome. Uh, we curate the Fantastic Arcade at the Alamo Draft House. Uh, where we select games from around the world, put them in custom arcade cabinets, um, they're exposed to people who attend the film festival, and then we also bring in special guests that kind of overlap with that. Oh, we don't have any uh, budget or anything at all for our thing. Like, we have just recently been accepting some, like, non y type donation things so that we can have a couple of computers that actually belong to our group, but since I mean, for the first like four years, uh, everybody just went and grabbed weird stuff out of their closets and brought it up and set it up. And we always uh, found spaces that would work with you uh, because it was a slow night for them. And so you could have the space as long as you could bring out some people. Uh, and so we've just, we've had zero budget for five years or something and it's still worked, it's still been great. And even though it's not a business thing, I know, I. 
I mean, I've, I'm working with people now that I met through uh, Wagos events, so it's just been cool. Thanks, Adam. All right, I'm going to uh, ask Jamie Sanchez to come over and take my chairman's seat. Uh, Jamie Sanchez is here representing Indie City in Chicago. Uh, she's a creative professional there, right in the middle of their growing indie scene. Uh, she consults on branding, marketing, and web needs for a bunch of games. And she's also the Indie City Collective board member, one of them, and project manager for Bitbash, the first indie game festival in Chicago. So please welcome Jamie Sanchez. And we'll plug in. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to point this out now that we are called Indie City, and a lot of people don't understand, like, Indie City, Indie City, it takes them years. <laughs> literally, we've been running this since 2010, and, and it has been literally years for some people. So, um, we are uh, Indie City, uh, uh, it, so it starts out, um, our story starts in 2010 about um, with Scott Roberts and Aaron Robinson and a couple of others who decided Chicago doesn't have a place for individuals to talk about what they're making, how they made it, who they, you know, who they should connect with. Uh, so they created a group called Indie City Games. We meet every two months, uh, usually at a university of some sort, uh, DePaul and Columbia being two of our primary uh, venues. They've been very generous, uh, and they're also very eager to work with us, uh, so they just donate the space. Uh, the organization has since changed hands to a group of people like uh, Ryan Wiemeyer, Andy Sea, Craig Stern, Rob Locke. Uh, those individuals have pretty much been declared like the board, but for the most part, anybody who's interested in getting involved in the community on an organizational basis, they can say, I want to be on the board, and we're just like, okay, cool. Um, so uh, overall, the organization, organization is very flat. Um, the meetings offer a networking space for people who want to show off their games. We usually do a post-mortem uh, or two per meeting. Um, you know, we, we bring in other people, we've done audio talks and branding talks and uh, had um, accessibility talks and we, we try to find speakers from all over the area that are cross-discipline as well um, and just kind of put in six hours on a Saturday and uh, do a little lunch break, stuff like that. Um, so that's, this is a sample of one of our meetings. We typically get up to uh, somewhere between 40 to 80 people at each meeting. Uh, it's all word of mouth for the most part, and Facebook event. Uh, there is a website, but you pretty much just see uh, who's going or not on a Facebook event. Um, and then for a sample of postmortem, we've had Octodads, to the young horses, kind of talk about their games. They, um, it it's up to the developer to figure out, like, well, what kind of talk is this? Is this a very personal, deep, meaningful talk, or is this a business talk with numbers? Uh, we're open to all of that. But it, a lot of it's about sh sharing successes and failures in the process of that game. Um, and just kind of let people know, you know, we've gone through some struggles, here's some things you should learn so you don't have to go through the same. Uh, and then roughly in, um, at the end of 2012, early 2013, we decided uh, a small group of Indie City Games members wanted to make a cabinet and showcase local Chicago games. Uh, so uh, Rob Locke and some individuals, Ben Marion, uh, and that's uh, Devin, a couple others, uh, actually crafted this cabinet, painted it, did it all up, and we ran uh, the Six Pack Game Jam. And it was a month long game jam where individuals made a game based on a theme. So the idea being this uh, arcade cabinet uh, is going to a local barcade. They've offered us space. So we're going to do a game, uh, game jam about drinking. So we made about, I want to say, 16 game jam games all about drinking. Uh, and the idea being that when it changes venues, if it goes to a pizza shop, we're going to make it do a game jam all about pizza. And if it, you know, if it's in the library, it's going to be all about books. So um, this is the installation of that. Uh, and again, a, a small segment of Indie City members had, had just done this of their own free accord uh, and of their own money. And then here's a sampling of those, some of the individuals actually making a game. Uh, and then in the launch party, uh, we had like red eye coverage, other news outlets came by and took some photos of that. And then we decided, uh, a number of us had quit our jobs and <laughs> uh, not wanting to work alone, we decided to rent a space 
um, myself, Ryan, and uh, Tom Eastman decided, well, if we're going to be able to fill six desks, we might as well get um, a full office space and see what we can, how far we could take it. And this is the point at which the organization uh, becomes uh, what we call the co-op versus games. Games is still very much this uh, zero budget um, community, open space, a lot of um, you know, free thinking and all of that, whereas the, the co-op is a little bit more curated and who we invite in because we are sharing our personal space, our creative space, we have a lot of expensive equipment there. Um, it is a little difficult for us to run public events out of this space, but um, we feel we get a lot out of it. You know, we're kind of all putting our time in um, and making sure that it's welcoming and inviting. So uh, this is our housewarming. Uh, we wanted to ensure, you know, people, our friends, the community knew that this was open, and if they're interested in a desk, you know, we're approachable, come on by. Uh, so here's some drinks, and we played some jobs uh, in, in like a 900 square foot space. Uh, and then over the course of time, just the difficulties of finding stuff to fill 900 square feet. Uh, you know, we had to pull up, pull up the walls. Um, things like house cleaning becomes an issue. You know, who's going to change the trash? Trash, and where do all these desks come from? Uh, so this, I have another photo from later, but this is kind of the progress of how that space grew from nothing to filling it with stuff and ideas and people. Um, but this wasn't enough for us. So another smaller segment of us decided, um, you know, we, we have this open free space that is Indie City Games, and then we have this, uh, you know, office space where creative people come and, and you know, work on their daily projects. Um, but we're not giving enough outreach to the community. Uh, and so we started, um, oh, I'm sorry, we did the Global Game Jam, actually, in this space, too. Uh, there were 30 developers. <laughs> And some of them crashed on the floor overnight. That was pretty fun. Arcade Brewery provided free beer. And before we knew it, uh, what we had initially planned for 300 people became 1,400 people. Uh, and it was just a really great time. I'm going to flip through some of the photos here. Um, and uh, many of our volunteers came from that initial Indie City Games meeting. You know, we had a line around the block. That was totally unexpected. Um, Arcade Brewery there. Uh, and the idea being that we wanted this collaborative um, space where we invited de developers and we divided um, our members of the community and we invited people who were familiar with indie games um, and curated the selection uh, of 30-some games. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was presented in such a way that you know, gave respect to the work. Um, and then we also wanted to compare it on a level that you know interactive games are also on the level of like posters. So we did a poster show, uh, we had musicians, um, we brought Killer Queen and a couple of other cab cabinets along, uh, and we had this really great outdoor space where we invited some food trucks. So this whole festival took four months of planning. <coughs> it um, was inspired, uh, we, we also collaborated with some uh, uh, local, um, Blue Trap is a great organization benefiting uh, Child's Play and other um, children's hospitals. Uh, people brought in their own games. That was something I wasn't expecting, where there was free space. They just like, out, like pulled out magic and started playing on the, like, just outside. It was really cool. Um, and so what I'd like to, oh, this is adorable. <laughs> um, it, we, it was really important that we invited all kinds of people to this event. We wanted um, families and just, we wanted to be very inclusive and diverse, and we wanted to show that games weren't just you know, on a computer or a TV, so we had um, some some other type of interesting games. So this is Relax Harder. This is a dad yelling at his kids to relax harder. <laughs> um, and again, joust, that seems to be a common thing that brings the community together really quickly. Uh, and then it turned into this really awesome space at night where people were just partying and having a great time. So um, this is the team that made it happen. Uh, most of those members are either friends of ours or, or have been Indie City members for a long time. Uh, and they were all excited to see this happen. And they, there's so much overwhelming support from this group because they saw how we performed at Indie City Games and how we present ourselves. And we know that you know, we're, we're both professionals and creatives and we like to have a good time. But uh, it was really great to have that testing ground to see who was to like kind of vet. Is this a, an idea worth having and making? And on top of that, who is actually going to be an active voice 
and Bonnie helping make this happen. Um, so as it is now, uh, we have Indie City Games, the arcade, the co-op, the collective, which is the nonprofit that bundles the money to the co-op and get that um, in Chicago. And what it could be in going forward is uh, a foundation that maybe takes grants and does some education, uh, a boot camp with other types of education. Uh, I don't know, a detective agency at this point is probably feasible. And we have joked about you know, making beer, doing a collaborative beer for effort. Uh, some words of advice. Uh, when you have strong personalities in your organization, uh, you should expect some conflicts to arise uh, because different people have different visions for what this is going to be. Uh, and so it's really important for you to sit down and be, make your very clear what your effort is going towards. Um, and, you know, in a very professional, calm way. Uh, because if once you start getting into heated debates over what it's going to be, you're never going to get off the ground. Um, it has taken a lot of our time. I think a community is a very important aspect to a lot of things I do in my life and what I create. Um, and without the people that are also donating their time, uh, especially with the bash, these efforts wouldn't happen. Um, but we do find that it, it starts to take up more of your business time than your play time. Uh, going back with scope, uh, when we had first started talking about BitBash, um, we were kind of, well, this could be a conference where we invite a whole bunch of people from out of city, you know, you know this is the developer thing, versus, you know, is this going to be like a wild rumpus-esque three-hour kind of party with a couple of computer games, but um, I think we hit the mark for what it was for Chicago. Uh, and then you want to maintain your community over time. Uh, once you get those first things going, like the first couple of meetings and you're seeing that momentum build, you can't let it drop. That's the perfect time to start nursing it a little further and pushing it a little further and letting people know that you're a reliable organizer. Um, having a place to meet is really important regularly and, and keeping a momentum where we meet every two months on a Saturday between two and six. Keeps people's schedules open, so that's something to consider. Um, so the three basic things you need, uh, a space. Um, you definitely, something free would be helpful. Uh, material to talk about and to engage with. And then again, that momentum. Once you have that momentum, it, it could go you know, a number of different ways. Uh, and you need zero dollars to do so, so uh, thank you. Next up uh, is Will Lewis representing Pig Squad in Portland. Uh, Will is a game developer and community organizer. Um, in April of 2011, he founded Indie Game Squad to bring together a community from all walks of game dev to provide events, resources, and professional opportunities to Portland and the greater Portland area. Uh, he's also a co-founder and co-director of Pixel Arts Game Education, providing games learning and positive peer adult mentorship and technology access opportunities to underserved and underrepresented youth in Portland. Uh, he speaks all over about community organizing and games learning and uh, did design on Cartoon Network's Monsters Ate My Birthday Cake. Uh, so please welcome to my chair, Will Lewis. Well, um, as I just said, I found a pig squad. I'm going to go over a little bit about, oh, it's in auto mode. Uh, I'm going to go over just uh, kind of my story and then kind of intersperse it with how I made that kind of stuff happen. Um, a lot of the similar stuff that everybody else has been talking about. Uh, I started out uh, going to Portland State University for film because I didn't have a lot of game schools in my area and not a lot of them were in reach regarding fund or money. Uh, cost, all that kind of stuff. So I went to Portland State for film because I was like, hey, film's kind of like video games. It's collaborative and uh, there's art in it, there's music, um, all kinds of that stuff. And in that program, it was much more of a film studies program than a production program. So I got together with a couple of students and we worked together to found the PDX Film Collective, which is pretty much what Pig Squad is, but for film. After a little while, I realized that I really didn't end up liking the film community in Portland very much. And uh, I just thought, oh, well now that I'm out of school, and I've kind of figured a little bit about this out, why not start this with games? 
So I started setting regular, consistent meetings, uh, like we did with the Film Collective. Um, I wanted to make something that was very inclusive and that resonated with what I initially wanted to do with games. I'm not very good at taking tutorials online to learn how to program. Uh, I really need somebody there with me to help me through. And, uh, but I'm good at art and writing and music stuff with games. So I, when I first started looking at our meeting structure, I just thought, how can I make this useful in the same way for other people? I thought, if I start a group of people, then in addition to myself, other people will be able to access uh, other people so that they can either have somebody take on a role that they can't do themselves or help them teach them that role. So I started with a monthly meeting. We met at the first Sunday of every month. Um, as Jamie said, consistency with that kind of stuff is very, very important. Uh, probably the most important, in my opinion, when you're very, very first starting that stuff. Um, I wanted the structure to pan out to where everybody listened to one person talk during at least a portion of the meeting so that somebody could say, hey, I'm an artist looking for a team, or hey, I'm a musician and I have no idea where to take my, um, my trumpet playing into a digital sphere. Uh, we're, like, we're a team and we're looking for a third programmer on our project or else we're not going to get it in ton and time. Uh, making sure that everybody could hear those kinds of things, that everybody learned each other's names, what they were working on, uh, so that eventually everybody knew each other really well and started working together, which happens. Uh, I also wanted to stress an inclusive environment. Uh, I always bring that up at the beginning of all of our meetings. Um, and kind of in keeping with that, I always make sure that I'm available to introduce people to each other. Some people don't want to come out, uh, so they stay online. Or some people who do come out leave right after the meeting because they're shy or um, think they can't do it or something like that. Uh, so I really wanted to encourage beginners as well to join up and work with us. So I always put myself out there to just say, hey, like, it, I know everybody here, or even if I don't, I'm comfortable approaching them, so I wanted to make sure that everybody had access to each other. Um, similarly with our online channels, uh, when we started Pig Squad, I wanted to make a Twitter account, we made a website, our main forum is on Facebook, just under Portland Indie Game Squad, and uh, I wanted to let everybody know that they were looking for help on a project, or if they want to advertise a project, or if we're doing an event together or anything like that, that I really wanted to plug their stuff via our channels, uh, which it becomes kind of easy because it's labeled an organization and a lot more people gravitate towards that if there's lots of games coming out of that organization or if there's lots of cool people or events going on in that organization. So uh, that helped out a lot just uh, referring all that stuff. So some of the work involved with making those monthly meetings when I very first started, uh, I mentioned consistency, um, both in person and online, uh, both are very important. So meeting once a month at the same time on the first Sunday or something like that, that's what ours was. Uh, talking online and just addressing the community online was also a very important thing regarding like just reaching out and finding new members and seeing who's out there and everything. Uh, like something like Reddit, Portland really, really helped uh, just because we could say, hey, we're doing this awesome thing and people would upvote it or not, I didn't really care. But a lot of people saw it because uh, a lot of people just go on Reddit, you know. Uh, same thing with Twitter and uh, like having people distribute posters at local universities or uh, just encouraging people to spread everything word of mouth. Just being very active in that way really helped just get a lot of people together and started these, this momentum with these meetings. Um, as Jamie mentioned, the location, and as everybody's mentioned, location can be very, very troublesome. And uh, just, I found out the hard way that just like cold calling and looking around, asking other people if they know people that own businesses or if they have a space. I know that a lot of meetup groups start at people's houses and stuff like that. And that's really what it takes. Uh, we, started using the Portland State University site for a while, but then eventually we found a lot of people in our area through things like Reddit and events uh, that worked at really big local tech startups. So we approached them, they were able to be on site with us during our meetings and we got those spaces for free. So that kind of stuff was really cool. Um, there's, always, there's always a big time and commitment risk when you're working with some kind of consistent events. 
Um, you have to make sure that you don't commit to too much towards the beginning. We started with our general meetings, and then probably after a year or so, we started doing art code nights. So we started meeting twice a month. Uh, with our art code nights, we just met up at a bar and just worked on our own projects in each other's company, which just kind of ended up being everybody, uh, as they say, always eating beer and drinking pizza together and playing each other's games and helping each other out and getting to know each other. Um, people would randomly bring their magic cards again. And um, after we did that, more people, since we're not a video game specific uh, community, people were asking about events specifically dedicated to board games and other tabletop games. Now we currently do three monthly events and if anything else comes up, uh, which just kind of happens a lot now just because of all the people that we've met along the way. Uh, we do that stuff too. So we're next year we're going to be doing four game jams, um, including Global Game Jam. Uh, our Oregon Museum of Science and Industry hosts after dark events where everybody can get wasted and look at a bit museum stuff. And uh, we go there and showcase games pretty often uh, at Maker Fairs, the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, all that kind of stuff. I make sure that I'm the barrier between the, I mean, not a barrier, but the, the liaison between members and the organizers of these expos. Uh, so many members, especially lately, have been really signing up for expos at things like the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. We get a table there and they showcase their games. And uh, they've been telling me a lot about how much it's helped get perspective on what their game needs, or how they need to talk to other people about their games, or how they need to describe their game to others when they're looking for collaborators. So, um, my job as a community organizer in Pink Squad is to make sure that they don't have to worry about any of the red tape regarding like getting into the expo or anything like that. I reserve a space and then say, you got four feet, make it cool, and if it isn't cool, you'll find out there, and then you'll be better next time. Uh, so, that's another thing that we do a lot is some of those expos, um, workshops, idea pitch nights, tournaments, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so from Pig Squad, uh, one of our members, uh, the middle one pictured, uh, he was looking for, his name is Jeffrey, sorry. Uh, Jeffrey was looking for uh, a way to make like a games library that people could uh, use them for kind of creative research and kind of integrate that into a coffee shop or something like that. Uh, after joining Pig Squad for a while and just seeing what people were talking about, looking at the games for social good movement and all that, he decided that that was not what he wanted to do, and he asked me to partner up with him in pixel arts game education. So we reach out to underserved youth in East and North Portland to provide them with better access to technology and positive mentorship and all that kind of stuff. Um, we do lots of game camps. That's our main mode right now of communicating technology access. But uh, next year, we're working with the Portland Art Museum to have youth teams make games to portray their uh, Greek art uh, gods and heroes exhibit. So that'd be a lot of fun. Um, and we leveraged our existing community with Pig Squad to have volunteers come in and become mentors for all the camps that we do and everything. So that was kind of a really cool and easy transition. Um, we work with the library system, we work with uh, a lot of local STEM and STEAM collaboratives, schools, uh, and then like I said, the Portland Art Museum project is going to be pretty big. Uh, so for me, community organizing became a career. Uh, I have income through Patreon, um, some larger techs, uh, tech expos and parties and events come through and they ask for me to assemble a games expo. So I do that and get paid that way, and I pay everybody else that way too, it's awesome. Um, teaching and administrating for classes, either utilizing the volunteer community, or teaching yourself, or working with somebody else uh, to offer <coughs> paid classes. Uh, in my case, we get paid through grants, and we experiment a little bit with paid classes for parents that can afford it. Um, we go, we get a lot, like I just said, that's on my notes right here. We get grants. Um, so that's really cool. And uh, we get support from local businesses interested in tech, trade organizations, and stuff like that. I solicit those kind of companies for game jams when they're coming up so that we can provide 
Uh, I think our last game jam, I provided breakfast and dinner for three days for developers when uh, we were doing a 48-hour game jam. So that was really cool. Um, and yeah, so now, uh, Pixel Arts Game Education, we did six summer camps this year. Uh, we're doing three this fall, and we're probably going to do another six in winter. Uh, we're doing that Portland Art Museum project next year. Pig Squad now has between 50 and 60 people coming to its monthly, first Sunday of the month meetings. We get around 40 people at our board game nights and art code nights, and then any of our other events. Um, we'll show it some couple thousand people expos and stuff like that. So it does get a lot of exposure, and it's really awesome. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm running out of time. So uh, yeah, please take down my information if you have any questions at all about organizing communities or how to just do it straight up from nothing. Uh, my budget was starting at zero as well. And just by reaching out, uh, either by reaching out yourself or working with somebody to be a personality, to just li like really go out and take the brunt of needing to reach out to people or cold call people or anything like that is really what it took to get Pig Squad off the ground. So that's kind of my number one uh, recommendation other than just making sure that everything's consistent, making sure that uh, you're comfortable reaching out for locations, uh, making sure that you manage your time commitment, uh, and making sure that you can make the group comfortable for everybody to join up. Thank you. Uh, next up is Adriel Wallach, uh, who is uh, representing some of her time in Boston, but also, and I'm very excited about this, uh, uh, the nomads, and not in a plural way, people who have been nomadic as game developers uh, and traveled around. Uh, she is an indie game developer. Um, she was originally a programmer on the next generation of weather satellites, and then she decided to explore gaming uh, as a developer uh, instead of just as a gamer. Um, she spent some time in AAA games, working on projects like Rock Band Blitz, and then she gave it up to Go Indie. Uh, she's now, she's been traveling around, participating in game jams, working on a few indie releases. Um, you might have seen some of her endeavors, including Train Jam, which is something she organizes every year, uh, and her ongoing Game a Week project. Uh, so please welcome Adriel. which taught me a lot about documentation. <laughs> um, so I was doing that, and I'd always been an avid gamer and, you know, growing up my whole life playing everything that I could get my hands on. Uh, but I never really saw game development as a career that I could have, because it just sounded like the coolest thing ever, and obviously a career is not the coolest thing ever. Um, so eventually, after I realized that making satellites is way cooler sounding than it is to do, I decided I really wanted to start making games, and I had no idea really where to start. Um, i have been programming for ages and playing games for ages, but I didn't really know how to make both of those, you know, smash together into the thing I wanted to do. Um, so I was in Boston at the time, living there, and I found out that there was literally a zillion different developer meetups in Boston every month. Um, so I started going to them, and the first one I started going to was our local IGDA meetup, 
uh, which was called Boston Postmortem, and it happened once a month, and there was usually a lot of networking and card giving out and that kind of stuff. Um, and it was it was nice, and I met a lot of different developers there, and they sort of introduced me to how you know what tools to download and what you know how to approach making a game and what to do, and you know it sort of came down to just making games. So I downloaded tools and started making games, and you know I'd take those games to other meetups because we had a local indies meetup, we had a local Unity developer meetup, and you know I just started going to all these and meeting all these people and really integrating myself into the community and working on side projects, showing them off, and then meeting other people, working on projects with them, showing those off, which eventually led to me being hired in an indie company, uh, which was Firehose Games, that's in Boston, and that's sort of where I really started my game development career, so um, communities were really important for me to even be able to do this at all, because without that I would have been completely lost. Um, so I sort of want to talk about why communities are important. Um, and that's the biggest reason, is that you are able to meet all these other people and, and be inspired and be motivated and have people to show things off to. Um, so yeah, so, so by being a part of these communities, I can do all that. Um, and that's really, like I said, where my game development career launched from. Um, so after that, after I had gotten so wonderfully integrated Oh wait, I'm supposed to be on this slide talking about Boston. That's my Boston slide. Um, so after I did that and I got so integrated in the Boston community and I, you know, was doing all this, um, I did this thing where I decided I didn't want to live in Boston anymore. But I didn't really have a place I wanted to go, so I did the only logical thing, which was to not live anywhere. Um, I let my lease expire, I put all my stuff in storage, and I got on a train and I headed out west, like, like this young gentleman right here. <laughs> Um, which is literally what I did. I had a suitcase and a laptop bag and I got on an Amtrak train and headed out west because um, I was going to PAX Prime at the time. Um, which actually is what birthed Trade Jam, which was a really interesting experience as well. But that's not really what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about communities. Um, so I went out west and stopped living anywhere. Um, so I guess it's sort of, you know, I haven't lived anywhere, how am I part of a community? Well, you know, I'm not part of a community anymore, I'm part of a lot of communities. Um, which is nice, I'm a, I'm a tiny part of a lot of communities now, and I sort of want to talk about a few things about that, sort of how communities allowed me to be nomadic for the last year and a half, and what it's like being a part of a lot of very different communities, because I've spent the last year and a half traveling around the US, traveling around Europe, just sort of hopping into places, you know, hanging out, meeting people, being inspired, and leaving again. Um, so the main reason that I sort of felt like I was able to go nomadic without being too terrified about not living anywhere anymore was that I had, you know, known so many people around the U.S., you know, from being in the Boston community and sort of going to different events, you know, even if you don't know anybody at that event, you probably know at least one or two people from your specific community, and those people will know one or two people from another community, and those people will know you know, four or five people from another community, all of a sudden you get this sort of like spread of just knowing all these people from all these different communities. So, you know, over the time of being part of the Boston community, I had gained sort of a little list of people that I knew across the U.S. So I knew I had a place to stay in Seattle, or I had a place to stay in Vancouver, which I know is not technically the U.S., but it's essentially there. Um, you know, or I had friends in Austin, and I knew I could just go to these events and sort of couch surf with them for a little bit and do that. And then by doing that, integrating into those communities, I met people that were international, and I went over to Europe and, you know, surfed around there for a while. Um, but it's weird because being, you know, knowing people through a community, you meet other people in the most random ways. Like, you know, I was at Unite last year, and I met up with a mutual friend, and we were just talking, and then mutual friend, or, you know, random friend went away, and then all of a sudden a stranger came up to me, and he was like, hey, I couldn't help but overhearing, but it seems like we have a lot of mutual friends. We should be friends. And I was like, huh, who do you know? And then it turned out we knew a bunch of the same people. And even though we didn't know each other, you know, we had a bunch of mutual friends and we knew that we had shared interests. And now we became friends. And, you know, he's somebody that I work with sometimes every now and again. And it's strange how that sort of happens, how integrating yourself into these communities just sort of spirals out of control and meeting lots of people. Um, so I guess more, I don't even know what, oh yeah, this was me networking. Um, so, the big thing that I sort of want to talk about now that I've rambled on about why knowing people is fun and you can travel around everywhere and it's wonderful is sort of why, why it's fun to be, or why it's inspiring to be a small part of a lot of communities. 
Um, so when I when I lived in Boston and that was the only community I knew, that was sort of what I envisioned every community was like. And the Boston community is awesome and inclusive and huge and inspiring. Um, but there was, you know, a lot of things where because we had so many technical schools in the area, a lot of the indie companies were a lot more just startup focused, you know, like we, we are a small company trying to be a small company. You know, we're not trying to do anything too super creative or too whatever, we're just a small company that wants to make games, we don't want to be AAA. So I sort of just pictured that's what every community was like, and then once I started branching out of that, you know, I saw more experimental fun game, no, not that Boston wasn't fun, that came out wrong. Um, you know, more experimental communities, like, you know, seeing what happens in New York City, or seeing what happens, you know, in Glitch City, there's a lot more, you know, sort of funky experimental stuff going on. And then even more so going over to Europe, and, and you know, where they don't quite have to worry as much about making money to afford health insurance, or things like that, you know, they sort of have these neat allowances afforded to them where they can just go off and do these totally wacky things, you know, um, and try a bunch of things without too much regard for having to make money just to survive because, you know, there's a lot of social support in, in place there. And you don't really think about these things when you're just part of one community. Um, so, I don't know, sort of being able to see all the different things and be inspired by all these different cultures, and then just like the different ways that cultures impact design and, you know, like, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but, you know, seeing, you know, the, how people grow up in Copenhagen is very different than how people grow up in Los Angeles, you know, or how people grow up in the Netherlands or in London or in Austin. Like, everything is very, very different. All these different little cultures, you know, sort of alter the different game designs and the different ideas, and it's been really interesting to be able to be a part of all of those and sort of have all of those interactions influence you and influence your ideas and, you know, uh, Say you're in the Netherlands and you're traveling around, it's like, hey, I kind of want to make a game about windmills now. Or, you know, you're in Los Angeles and you want to make a game about heat because it's hot here all the time. Um, and it's just, it's, it's neat to sort of go to all these different places and meet all these different people and just, you know, make lots of ideas with people. Um, that's what that slide was for. So, um, I, I've been able to do this by being, you know, nomadic and traveling around and whatever, but I feel like even if you aren't nomadic and you do live somewhere, you know, it is possible to sort of reach out to other communities. Because everybody very much focuses on their community in their area, which is great, you know, that's wonderful. But I really like the idea of, you know, cross-pollinating and, and being able to reach out to their communities and maybe, like, be part of this global community so that you're able to just sort of learn a bunch of things from a bunch of other people and, you know, have all these different experiences and these different backgrounds. I mean, it goes into the whole why, you know, diversity is such an important thing because you want to have different backgrounds and different different sort of experiences, you know, influencing all of your things, and I don't know, I, I don't really know where I want to go with this, but I, I sort of wanted to do this little inspirational thing of, like, communities reaching out to other communities and sort of being able to share ideas sort of like this where we're all talking to each other and, and you know, sharing all of our experiences, but I just, I really like the idea of, of how I've been able to just gain all of these different views and and experiences from all these different people from across the U.S. and Europe, and, I think that would be a really neat thing, you know, just sort of, that's what the internet is great for. You can reach out to other people and join forums and join this and join that and be parts of lots of communities, like a little global community almost. Um, so, I don't know, that's sort of where I want to end is how it's been really interesting to, to cross-pollinate between all these communities and be inspired myself and hopefully bring stuff back to other communities as I travel around to them. Um, so, I don't know, reach out to lots of people. People are great. Communities are great. The internet is great most of the time. Um, this is me. This is how you get to talk to me, usually, because I don't know where I ever am, ever, but I am usually near the internet. Um, so yeah, that's me, and that's my rambling about living around the world and meeting lots of people. Uh, one more speaker. The house would like to seed, is the right word? Seed five minutes to the gentleman from Glitch City, Ben Esposito. Uh, Representing Glitch City LA, Ben is a game maker currently developing his solo project, Donut County, with support from Indie Fund. Uh, ben co-founded Glitch City uh, with the in LA, and the internet troublemakers Arcane Kids. Uh, ben was previously a level designer for Unfinished Swan and is contributing design to Giant Sparrow's next project. Please welcome Ben Esposito. <laughs> you guys can see all my text is in, that was awesome. <laughs> Good. 
I'm going to try and do this really fast because I know we're over time. Um, also, this is moving automatically. <laughs> hey. Hey. Um, so, hey, I'm Ben Esposito. Um, I'm representing Glitch City, which is uh, quite a large organization now, and we all are, we all come from different backgrounds, and we all have kind of different ideas about what we want out of it. Um, so I'm going to just explain how we built what we built and what has been useful about it. Um, so, let me see. Uh, Glyph City is a uh, collaborative workspace of artists and game makers um, in LA. It's in Culver City, so it's actually just uh, down Washington Boulevard right over there. Um, and if you want to visit or whatever, come talk to me and maybe we can make that happen. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm just going to talk about uh, how we built it because I think that might be useful to people who are interested in making kind of a workspace type situation in their community. Um, so Glitch City started out as just a little thread of an idea between a couple of friends um, who are independent game developers and also artists, so people who are in motion graphics. Um, we would meet in a garage and had an open studio and we worked together. Um, and it was really fun, but we wanted uh, more out of it. We wanted more people to join and share work and share perspectives. So we started meeting at coffee shops on Sundays, um, and we called the event Strawberry Jam, and we would each bring our computer, and we would just work together. And it's the kind of like, we're together alone thing that really, like, it helps me a lot to um, be more productive, and it, it apparently helps a lot of other people too. So that grew and grew, um, and we wanted to make a, we decided that we wanted to make a space because it's a thing, the working together thing, was really valuable to all of us, and we wanted a place where we could do that every day. Um, and so, it came, Glitch City came less out of a like community, um, like a, an outfacing community thing, and more of a we need to support ourselves and as artists and find a space where we can do our best work. So we had a big meeting, and we had a family dinner, and we pooled our resources and saw how much money we had. Um, and we looked for places, and so we drove around, we found Culver, uh, we decided Culver City was a good spot because LA is very big and sprawling, and we wanted to um, find somewhere, somewhere that was kind of central, and the, in Culver City uh, is accessible from public transportation, and it's also not too far from the west side. Um, so, I think, yeah. Um, so anyway, we, uh, found the space, we each donated a certain amount of money, whatever we could afford, and pulled it together, and we leased the space, um, and we got our building. So, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, artists. The idea of, of Glitch is just to be supportive of one another, so we're independent <coughs> game developers, and we're also independent artists, um, and we're each trying to figure out a way to become sustainable, and so the space is really useful for us to share ideas and to um, support each other with opportunities that we might get that might not have been accessible otherwise. Um, and having a space helps that happen um, regularly instead of just in like a kind of nebulous um, network of emails. So some of the events that we do that are internal to us that help us a lot are show and tell, which is pretty straightforward of showing our work once a week. Um, but then also we do an event called Project Workshop which is super useful. It's like a group therapy session um, where we each get 10 minutes to share a little bit about what we're working on and a problem we might be having. And then we, um, everyone uh, gives advice and just talks it out and helps each other. And then usually that'll spawn a conversation that we can go and talk about outside of that. Um, the other thing is uh, being in a space with other artists um, has led to a lot of collaborations that have been really cool and would probably not have happened otherwise in LA. Um, so one of the big examples is a game called Hyper Light Drifter. Um, and the story of that is long and complicated, but um, a lot of the people who are working on it now met through Glitch City through events, um, or they were working together and they were an artist and a programmer who like both synced up um, because they ended their projects and they were looking for something new. Um, so that's, that group came together through Glitch. Um, also, we do events with outside organizations. So there's an, uh, uh, an organization called Cinefamily in LA that uh, is an independent movie theater. 
and most recently we did a project with them called Y2 Cafe, which was a um, like a 1999 inspired um, virtual reality lounge as part of their um, Everything Is Festival. Um, um, and then the last thing that I also want to mention is we did a we do game nights regularly, but um, one of the cooler things we did was a fundraising game night um, for our friend Alex who um, was having health troubles and huge hospital bills, and so we did we all kind of like created this huge event and showed our video games and gave stuff away, and we raised eighteen hundred dollars for him, so that was really cool. Um, so we started as a collective workspace to help each other out. Um, but then we decided that it would be really useful to like reach out to a larger group. Um, so the other thing we wanted to do was not limit ourselves to video games. So we've created a bunch of other events that help bring in new types of people to the space so they can talk to game developers and artists and maybe start new collaborations. So some of the stuff we do are um, doodle fests, which are just drawing only nights. Um, that And we try to incorporate as many games as possible to help people like uh, meet each other and share their skills. Um, Glitch Nitty is a, a knitting group that we do. Glitch Nitty. Uh, uh, our most recent event, Grand Old Glitch, was a uh, show that had everything except video games. Um, so we had poetry and storytelling and music. Um, and we also worked with LA Zine Fest, um, which happened across the street, and we had a table there and we shared video games with them. Um, so I think. I think I'll just wrap it up now. Um, yeah, the last things I just wanted to say are that um, the way we organize is pretty simple. Um, we're a big group, and so everyone's a self-starter. And the way I look at it is if you want to get something done, you start it yourself, and then build momentum, and people will start joining you and joining you, and if it's a good idea, it'll resonate with people, and then we can start to make steps towards it. And so all of our events start by one person, they bring another person on, and they start gaining momentum. Um, also, having a physical space was instrumental to like building our community in LA. Um, and so we paid for our space because we had the, the resources to do it. Um, but there's plenty of other ways to get money and get donations of space uh, to help you organize. And I think that's a really nice first step. Um, and last, our, we, we have some troubles uh, gaining um, uh, getting everyone to agree on, on our, our directions. So the most recent thing we implemented was family dinner, which is whenever we have a meeting, we just have a dinner that's a potluck, and we talk everything out. Um, and <laughs> that's our like super informal process that's been uh, really good for us. And so if you have any questions, you can talk to me, you can talk to Teddy. Um, we'd be happy to share strategies and stuff. Um, so thanks. <laughs>